Well, good morning. And welcome to Advent. This season of four Sundays leading up to Christmas Day, it has snuck up on us just like that. At least it has on me and uh, in my home. If you're anything like uh, my house, we still have uh, uh, Thanksgiving decor. If you still have Thanksgiving decorations in your house, be grateful for those kinds of things. You're forgiven. Do you have Halloween decorations in your yard? You may want to get <laughs> may want to get a little busy. You know, we think about Advent as uh, the four weeks that we prepare for the birth of the Christ child, and that, that's right, but it's only partially correct. The season of Advent and, and the Christian calendar as a whole can be traced all the way back to around the fourth century. At least traces of it can be and you move ahead a little bit to around the fifth or sixth century and that's when we really begin to see advent the season of advent taking shape and from early on uh, advent had sort of a dual purpose yes uh, it was in part about preparing for the birth of jesus but in large part, it really was about something else. It was about preparing for the second coming of Christ. It was about the return of Jesus. For instance, the word Advent itself actually comes from the Latin Adventus, which is closely connected uh, to the Greek word parousia. And parousia actually uh, means uh, the second coming of Christ. Therefore, you will note if you follow the lectionary readings for, uh, for the season of Advent, you'll note that the first three, two to three weeks of the season of Advent, the, the text, the lectionary texts, really are not about Mary and Joseph preparing for the birth of, of the Christ child at all. Instead, the readings are about what the world does to prepare for the return of Jesus. And I'm sure if, uh, if most of us were honest, we really would rather not think about that. How many of us really do think about or even want to think about the second coming of Christ? Because let's be honest, we've got pretty good lives right now. Right here. And most of us would probably prefer that those lives not be disrupted. Maybe even by Jesus. But I can assure you that that is not the case for a lot of people. Maybe, maybe even hundreds of millions of people. People who long for the day when Christ returns. People living in situations of war, poverty, disease, persecution, injustice, people all over the world who, who can't wait, I mean literally can't wait for Jesus to come back and to set things right, to set their lives right. We get a little glimpse of this in our, in our scripture today from the prophet Isaiah. Now obviously Isaiah is in the Old Testament, so his writing you know, predates the birth of Jesus, but he's calling for God to return to the people, much like we might expect Christians to call for the return of Jesus today. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens. We've already heard it a couple of times. We heard it in our Advent candle reading. We, heard, we just heard it in our scripture. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake, so the nations might tremble at your presence. These are not the words of, of someone who's content with the status quo. Isaiah wasn't okay with the way things were at the time. They're looking for God to do something big and audacious. Isaiah's looking for God to, to change 
the, the very makeup of everything. This is how the people of Israel had always experienced God before during, during uh, difficult times. That's just who God was to them. I mean, God was the God of creation. The Lord who swept across the darkness and, and said, let there be light. That's who they thought of when, when they thought of God. God was the God of the, the Lord of the flood and the ark. God did big things. The Lord of the Exodus, who parted the Red Sea and brought manna in the wilderness, who, who led his people out of captivity by uh, fire and a cloud. So, so when Isaiah says, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, I really don't think he's just speaking poetically here. This, this is not hyperbole necessarily for, for Isaiah. He is really looking for, for God to, to come down and to do something really big and to take charge and to make changes to everything that God's people have mismanaged. He's calling for God. He's praying for God to set things right again. But there's a problem for Isaiah. God has been hidden from the people. At least that's how Isaiah perceives it. He, even, he says so a couple of times just in the passage that we just heard. God, you've hidden your face from us, he says, a couple of times. You've hidden your face from us, and you have delivered us into our sin. It's almost as if he's blaming God for the people's bad behavior. That's an interesting approach, isn't it? It's almost as if he's saying, well, God, you know, we haven't seen you in a while. So what did you expect from us but bad behavior? If, you're not gonna, if, if we're not going to see you, if we're not going to see evidence of you, then of course we're going to sin. I would not recommend that in your own prayers to God, by the way. But was God really absent from his people? Or did they just not know where to look? What's that old song? You know the song, looking for love in all the wrong places. And I'm sure it's true of God's people, of all, not just Isaiah's time, but it's true of us as well, that we're guilty of looking for God in the wrong places. Like Isaiah, we often assume that God just resides high above us, way up there, way out there, and God must tear open the heavens and come down to us from afar and do something miraculous in order for us to perceive God. And sometimes that has happened. I just documented some of those times when it did. But most times... That's not how we see God. That's not how we meet God most of the time. And if Advent is a time when we are looking and preparing to meet Jesus and his return, then we should be alert. We should be looking out for Jesus. And make no mistake, Jesus tells us where and how and when we're most likely to see him. This is not really a mystery. Jesus says, I am not hidden from you. I'm not hidden at all. In fact, if you were here last Sunday, you heard David talk about this very thing in his sermon. Jesus says, I'm not hidden from you. I am, I'm the one who is hungry and thirsty and naked, and you have the opportunity to, to feed me, to clothe me. I'm the stranger that you have the opportunity to welcome into your midst. I'm the one who's sick. You have the opportunity to, to take care of. I'm the prisoner 
you have the opportunity to visit. And when you spend time with and, and take care of and welcome and visit any of these, Jesus says, you have done this for me. I'm not hidden, Jesus says. You just have to open your eyes and open your mind and know where to meet me. I don't blame Isaiah for wanting God to, to tear open the heavens. The people of Israel had been through so much, so many disasters, such a great deal over many generations, so much destruction, so much exile. They'd seen their temple destroyed. They'd been through so much family separation. It would have been wonderfully convenient if God had, had worked some miraculous deeds to remind the people to turn back to God. But the truth was, God was in their midst all along, just as God is in ours now. We have a conspicuous and an unhidden God. And as we begin this new Advent season, we prepare for the return of Christ by realizing that he's really already among us. And the way that we're prepared to welcome the stranger and the outcast and to care for the poor and, and the prisoner and the sick and the hungry is really how well we're prepared for Jesus himself.